So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to LA Louver. Um, this is our fifth uh, art talk uh, for this year's uh, Rogue Wave exhibition. And we're ha very happy to have three of our artists here to um, make an introduction to their work this evening for you. And um, we'll follow that with any questions you have. Um, and uh, the three artists we have are Matthew Brandt, who's downstairs, Farrah Karapedian, and Sarah Awad. And Sarah's two paintings are uh, to my right and left here, and Sarah is to my right. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to her, and she'll uh, tell you a little bit about her work, and again, we'll follow with questions. I would simply ask that since we are recording this, I'd like to bring the mic to anyone who does have a question so we can get that properly recorded for the archives. So. Without further ado, Sarah Wad. Maybe I should actually stand in the middle. Here we go. <laughs> it's easier. Um, so these, these paintings are part of a body of work that I began in January of this year. So just so everyone knows, I don't always paint nudes. Um, but uh, began this in, in January. And um, it kind of grew out of um, a place where I was painting a lot of um, interior museum spaces. And um, the sculpture in those museum spaces was becoming a figurative element as an interruption in the landscape. Um, and started to isolate those and um, kind of uh, find myself really enjoying just painting the form of the figure. And that's kind of how these, these works emerged. Um, and thinking about the potential for um, painting them large and full frame and what that would do to change the painting. Um, so uh, this work on my left here um, uh, actually was, I, I went to, um, I was in New York this year um, visiting the Matisse show, which was fantastic and hugely inspirational, and um, happened to go to the MoMA and um, see the Mayol sculpture that's in the sculpture garden there. Um, and took a really crappy snapshot on my cell phone of that sculpture and just came back in, in LA and I was like looking at this snapshot being like, this is just so amazing, this gesture, this pose, this kind of the, the monumentality of this form and could totally see it as um, a, in my head of um, this figure kind of falling out of the frame of a painting and simultaneously also pushing against um, the edges of that frame. So. That's kind of where this work came from. Um, and so that I will, uh, leads me to my next point, which is um, that a lot of people will ask me, um, can I model for you? I'm just kidding. They actually, <laughs> they actually ask me, um, do you work for models? And um, the answer to that question is no. All of these works are based on other uh, artists' drawings and sculptures. A lot of drawings recently. I mean, I started working from some of my old sculptures Really, that's the only one. But um, there was, if you came to the opening, you would have seen a different painting here in this place. It was based on a Mayol woodcut um, of, I think, uh, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, or so he just did a bunch of illustrations of um, kind of classical mythology, and um, uh, found found some of his drawings, um, the poses, the gestures, to be kind of inspirational. So, um, and I, I've been working from. Um, gestures that there's something classical about the form, um, but right now I'm kind of working through that onto um, kind of a more modernist and contemporary take on the figure. Um, so uh, a lot of the paintings actually um, do really deal with space, um, and uh, they're kind of more about um, formal aspects, shape, color, line, the lyricism, um, the, the gesture of the figure, but um, kind of um, in this, this way of handling the paint that's like a layering or a carving out of space. So for a while now I've been working with kind of a painting process that um, starts with um, many, many layers of like stuff happening in the painting. And then kind of um, the final layer is actually a carving out or an editing um, uh, built up of those layers. So. Um, for these works, instead of kind of reclaiming old paintings, I actually just started with painting abstract color fields and landscapes and um, kind of working from there. And then as the figure started to kind of emerge on top, really wrestling with and figuring out what that space was going to look like and how they related to the, the, to the full painting. Um, so like this, this painting, you know, is 
um, based on just, I think, Picasso and the, the ideas of like the reclining nude, but um, really thinking about how, like what it, what it does to kind of flatten this area um, and leave it kind of empty and open and actually frame out that leg instead of painting the positive space, painting the negative. Um, and for a, this actually, this painting sat in my studio for probably three months without getting finished. It was a, a place where it was so wrong that I couldn't figure out what to do with it or how to resolve it, but I knew that it was a good painting and it just had to be finished. Um, and so, you know, making decisions like, okay, if this, this is gonna kind of carve out the figure on the bottom, it might need something reciprocal on the top, like that flat, flat green area. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm working, but um, yeah. Should we, I was gonna, gonna actually read a really great quote by Diebenkorn that I wrote on a little piece of paper and it's in my purse downstairs. <laughs> about the figure and the, just like the challenges of painting the figure because to be honest with you I never I, I, I in the midst of doing these I've thought many times this is the most absurd thing I could possibly be doing is to like be painting such a traditional subject matter today you know and not even really sure if that's justified but yeah well the, the interesting thing from visiting your studio um, when we first the first paintings in this group that you had done were very descriptive and everything was very resolved. There was uh, like a formal resolution to everything. And what's interesting is how things gradually, as you went through the series and painted more, became more fragmented. And you were very comfortable with things being like in the state of forming or questioning that sense of how the figure is inhabiting the space and kind of creating these kind of conundrums of like how can that actually exist in a certain way. Yeah. So it's really fascinating to see how you became more and more comfortable with a certain loose, looseness and just the whole endeavor. Yeah. Like just the idea of asking myself what's necessary. Like, you know, that question of finish is always on the back of my mind, but kind of what's necessary to have the painting exist the way that it needs to. And often really destroying moments that are too resolved. Um, because some, a challenge that I've had is also, um, because the figure is such a psychological snag, um, it helps me to distance myself from the subject. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm using other artist drawings instead of um, for working from models. But um, like, what is the face supposed to look like? What's the expression on the face? Like, I don't want it to be a point where you get stuck in the painting. I want it to feel like um, it's actually just as fragmented or divisive as the rest of the painting. Does anyone have any questions? Several. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let's start here. I came in and then saw it uh, last week and I was just totally blown away because I thought it was so creative the way you used the color in the way you were weaving the color back and forth through the figure. And was it Matisse that inspired you or was it basically, how did you figure out, you know, like where the darks were going and where the pieces of green were going? I mean, and it looks so free and spontaneous and so fresh. Thank you very much. Um, I actually try to deliberately um, make wrong decisions, like fictional, de it's about making a fictional decision. Like the beauty of painting is that it can be fictional. It's a combination of, um, it's a fictional interpretation of observation in a way. And so like the fact that the body would be, you know, divided into three different colors or something like that, or like this, that the, it would, you know, deciding in advance that it would be these two really high key saturated colors that are almost the same value. Um, right now I'm working on um, a new that has yellow in the shadow instead of something dark. So this, the body is kind of purple, but the shadow is yellow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those kind of fictional decisions I find a lot of pleasure in. And it takes me out of the moment of having to like let my subject dictate what I'm doing. Instead, I get to dictate it. Well, actually, my question was kind of along the same lines. Like, how do you choose your color palettes? You know, they're very unusual. It, they, they evolve, you know. I actually start by mixing up a palette, and um, uh, often they are actually also based on other artists' works. Like, I'll see something that I really love and be like, oh, that combina color combination is fantastic, and kind of start with that. Um, but then they, they grow and they change because it's not, it, it really is an evolution process. They... I don't, I'm constantly like taking time to sit and look at them and decide what has to happen next. 
Yeah, I don't know if that helps because everyone always asks me about color, but I don't really, I will say that my palette used to be a lot more gray. I use a lot of like grays. Everything is mixed. And so there's, in terms of um, hue or tone, they're a lot brighter than they used to be and a lot more artificial, which I'm enjoying. So these are not your favorite colors that... Well, you, this, this, <laughs> this... I mean, green, you wear gray. I'm kind of... I will say that I bought lemon yellow for the first time this year, and I thought, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> I'm going to be addicted to this color. <laughs> they can be very seductive sometimes. I had a question about scale uh, when related to the human figure. Both of these figures... Uh, in the paintings are of, of our scale, but just a little bit larger. Um, is that um, an element that you're engaging with, or are there nudes that are smaller? Um, I actually haven't really made work smaller than this and for this subject. I think um, scale and size is very important, and um, for these paintings, it's dictated what size the painting should be. Um, because I, I actually enjoy the fact that they're slightly larger than life. They give a kind of a, a, attention to, to the piece. I also um, just really like love working with big brushes and my whole body to kind of create them. Right now, the paintings in my studio are nine feet tall. So, and the women are actually standing and actually cropped. So they're quite a bit larger than that. Um, but they still feel like somehow like they're relating to the space of the painting and like the context that they're situated in. Yeah, they change the context of the room that they're in. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you almost, what they're actually doing right now, I think, is you almost, you get kind of shocked by their monumentality, but then it almost disappears, and then the painting comes forward. It's this weird, at least for me. I don't know if it does it for anyone else, but. Anyone else? Uh, hi. Um, I, I was here at the opening I talked to you, uh, and I saw the one that was there, and the colors were outrageous. And I first saw it and thought, those colors are outrageous, and then it just, they were wonderful and fantastic, and then that one as well. And um, I've been thinking a lot about it and looking at them again every time I come on a Thursday, and it seemed to me that um, you, you had the, you gave yourself permission to go wild with the colors, because you were then anchoring the whole thing with a kind of archetypal shape. And it, 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 the feeling I had was that I was safe because there was this archetypal sort of figure, but then I could let myself kind of go with the, go with the, with the chaos as well. I, I think they're absolutely wonderful, your paintings. Thank you. Yeah, um, to that note, I actually um, talked about my work with a couple art other artists at Diane Rosenstein Gallery about a month ago, and one of the other artists mentioned that exact same thing, and it was the first time that it occurred to me, yeah, the drawing actually is a huge part of the painting and anchors the painting. That line kind of holds the whole thing together and allows me to do a lot of crazy stuff that <laughs> otherwise I couldn't get away with. Yeah, absolutely. Are there um, specific artists? I mean, you mentioned Richard Diebenkorn, clearly an influence, but um, this isn't his palette. So, <laughs> what? I mean, are you know, there. And the funny thing is, early on, I mean, I've always loved Diebenkorn, I still do, but early on, the works were really influenced by him. And I think that his, there's something about, very stagnant about when he paints, you just have this really. The, the figures are very rooted. You have the sense that he's drawing them over long periods of time, like a four-hour session or something like that. Um, there's something about Kirchner that's been really exciting me because his figures feel like full of energy and um, very, um, uh, um, like almost just like caught in, caught in a moment in the same way that kind of photography captures something in a moment. There's a sense about about those. Um, but as far as like the way that I'm painting, I'm really, really influenced by um, Raoul Dufy and um, Picasso. <laughs> it's like terrible reference, but I like every time I see a Picasso painting, I just want to shoot myself because I'm like, how can anyone do it better than that? But um, there's, yeah, something really inspiring about um, the way that they were working. On the other hand, I'm also questioning it because 
I feel like one of the advantages that a lot of those, those artists had was that they had their studio lives set up in a way that the paintings were a natural emergence from um, their life and their practice. It, for example, they lived in lush, romantic French villas, and they had patterns draping the walls and this, you know, the architecture of the space and, and the people that they associated with it was very conducive to the kind of work that they were making. Um, I work in a warehouse in um, 2013 Los Angeles. It's cement floors, it's drywall and skylights. And I wonder how to cultivate a practice that uses what they learned about painting, but approaches it from an entirely different way. It's a good summation. Oh, wow. Um, any other questions out there? Oh, good. How do you know when you're done? <laughs> What's the final stroke on the canvas? How do I know when it... <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's... It, like I said, this went unfinished for three months. Chris was like, oh, are you going to finish this painting for the show? <laughs> you know? And then it was like, you know... Two, hour, two hours, a couple moves, and it was done. It, it just, it's kind of finding that right note, like this, like this bright pink color contrast. With, imagine that painting without that pink, and that's kind of how it sat for a very long time. Um, I added the pink because um, it needed it, but I actually thought I was gonna cover it up completely. And then once I added it, I was like, oh, that has to stay, and I have to figure out a way to make that stay. So, I mean, it's, it, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> It's more intuitive. It's like painting is like thinking, I think. You know, you're a painter. Well, not when you're finished, but when you're done. Oh, when I'm done? <laughs> I don't understand. We'll have to think about that. But it's always haunted me. Mm. Even when I go see my paintings and I look at things I did 30 years ago and I go, I want to take my paint out again and keep some space. But I don't because it was of the time. Yeah, yeah. I never feel like that. <laughs> I've, a lot of painters have told me, once you sign it, you're done. Hmm. And then some painters say, you're never done. Well, I know, I, I have this, there's this thing like when people photograph it, then they want to be able to say that it's, you know, once you photograph it, I don't believe that. I think that it's, it's, it's my work. I could take this home tomorrow and keep working on it if that's what I wanted to do, but I, I think I have this mentality about my practice that it's like I'm constantly trying to move forward. So I feel like once something is kind of resolved for me, the, the next question emerges in the studio and that was what drives me. So I'm really not interested in kind of rehashing old stuff, um, but moving forward. So. Excellent, anyone else? Well, it's a wonderful introduction to the work, Sarah. Thanks. <laughs> Much appreciated. Hello, everyone. So we're ready for our second artist. And I'm very pleased to introduce Farrah Karapedian to you. And her work is uh, surrounding you right here in, in our lobby, this piece behind us, and then the um, diptych that's um, surrounding that doorway. And um, I will uh, leave it to you. Uh... Here we go, one moment. Uh, Farah. Hi. Um, surrounding is an interesting word um, because you guys are actually in the piece. <laughs> and, and that makes me think that I should start not by talking about my process necessarily or, or by talking about the encounter that I have with the guys who are in, in, in the photograms, but maybe about your encounter with the photographs and how that differs from a conventional encounter with a photograph. Um, this piece was made for this site, so it's not site specific, but it's site responsive, right? Um, it's designed so that you're actually walking in it. It's designed around that aperture. These guys are stacked up on that doorway, so they're about to clear that room. They're veterans of the, of the US military, and, and they're all trained to clear rooms, which is to say they're trained to go inside and uh, address an enemy. <laughs> Um, and they, they're trained to stand in this particular posture around an aperture. There's a breacher over there who opens the door and these guys then file in with their weapons. So I was looking for a space um, with an aperture 
for which to make this piece. Also, this sniper, you know, as you can tell, parasites off of this architecture, which Louvre actually wonderfully built for it. Um, <laughs> but um, it becomes kind of a really natural spot for this spy sniper to aim towards the stairwell. So as you guys were walking down the stairwell, you were actually, again, part of that piece. And on the stairwell as well, there's a, there's a vitrine, which seems so naturally a part of that space because the steel matches the handrail because it's kind of situated dimensionally so that it fits into this kind of built-in um, plinth that exists already in the architecture here. So these things, if I've done my job, they feel very natural to you. They feel as if they're just a part of the architecture. Um, and that is an unconventional response to the idea of the photograph, right? Usually when you're looking at a photograph, you're looking through a window. You're looking at a picture, and then you're looking through it. And the scale of the piece is not something that's built into it. The scale of it is, is emotive, it's, um, but it's also arbitrary. And in this case, what you're looking at is, is something just very slightly larger than life size, but that's, but that's that size because that's the way the experience is lived by the people in the pictures, and it's also that size because their bodies are very literally transcribed onto the photographic paper. Um, and you hear a lot about kind of relationships between photography and sculpture these days. You hear about um, people who are doing really creative and experimental things with photographs, manipulating them physically in space. I'm not so creative. <laughs> I'm not necessarily making up these relationships to space. I'm looking at space, and I'm inheriting the memories of people to space. Um, and I'm kind of bridging the gap between those two things. So scale and a, and a relationship to the idea of sculptural space as real space is, is, where, is where this work ends up forging an encounter with you and your body, um, as, as might a building, as might um, a sculpture. Um, that's, that is my relationship to sculpture through photography. But also I'm making these sculptural negatives. So if, if any of you have kind of questions about the nature of my relationship um, or the relationship I'm kind of um, creating between the photograph and the sculpture, it does also kind of enact itself in the, in the negatives, which, which are objects. They're clear objects through which light passes and gets transcribed onto paper. And that's because, again, there's a relationship between an object and a body. You hold that object, and it, it has a weight and a size and a function. And so when I'm making these negatives, I want the soldiers to feel as if they're holding something akin to what they would have held in war. Um, and one further note about the vitrine as a part of this architecture, it's also kind of created um, really directly in response to my experience of institutional settings. When you look at, at weapons at the Met or in the DIA, you're looking at them in vitrines and you're looking at them in these kind of display conventions that indicate that they've been historicized in some way. So it was really fun for me to put those weapons that were used um, in, in a kind of a contemporary artistic deployment um, into one of the kind of display conventions of history making and see if there was any kind of a rub between the two, what happens when you're looking at something that's not associated with knighthood but is instead associated with the Middle Eastern conflict. <laughs> but it's in the display convention of history. So those are the kinds of physical encounters that I'm looking at, like how do these objects relate to your body when you're in the space? How do you relate to them in terms of scale and weight, volume? Um, but the real place where it starts is with another physical encounter, and that's between me and these guys in the dark. Um, and it starts for them long before that in, in a real situation that they've experienced physically and that they're interesting with me with in terms of their memory. Um, the middle guy in the photogram <laughs> was my student. His name's Justin, and he was, uh, he was a Navy SEAL for 12 years. And um, he heard me talking about how photograms are composed physically in the dark. You know, you're blind, you're in a room in, in total darkness. And oftentimes when you're composing people's bodies in that kind of a space, they need to be able to touch each other in order to find their place. Um, he also heard me kind of talk about an architecture as, as kind of a final site of encounter for an artwork. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I have this memory and this association with something that we do in the military. It's this stacking a door. Um, and that was probably last fall. And I spent six months kind of with this image that captured my imagination, um, building the weapons that they would hold and sourcing other items and other like pieces of gear. And then I brought them into the dark room and I um, asked them to bring some of their own gear. And as they were unpacking their bags, they, they were kind of unleashing the smells of their last deployments and um, bringing up a lot of stories that, um, that kind of came up with those smells. Um, 
So there's this physical encounter that he's had in his actual deployment. There's this physical encounter that happens in, over the course of six months as I'm making stuff and kind of really learning, learning the situation that I've been told about. And then there's this physical encounter that happens in the dark, which is confusing, but also fun and brings up a lot of narrative. Um, and you know, the actual exposure only lasts a few seconds, but it's a moment at which his memory becomes a new fiction. And this is no longer about what happened to him over there. It's about what happens in the dark room. And the color is something that you know, becomes a plastic part of my process, um, fairly associative. Um, in this case, we called it Apocalypse Now Orange. Um, <laughs> um, and that's, again, something that's unconventional to photography, right? We don't generally um, have a plastic relationship to color. We're generally asking you to look through that window onto a real world. Even if it's constructed, we're asking you to consider it as a real thing. But what I'm interested in here is um, not lying to you about the fact that this is totally reenacted. Um, and in kind of like having them having their own real experience in the darkroom and that meaningful encounter for me, for them, and then trying to translate that into your physical experience of the encounter of the work in the gallery. Fair, I think it might be interesting to hear a little bit uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of how it works because not everyone's, I mean, like I was a little confused at first, I have to confess, like how the, what you actually do with these guys in the dark and how you uh, particular color results, for instance, or why you might call a certain object you produce in resin a negative. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So in this case, gentleman in the pink shirt, <laughs> lay down in, uh, in front of a piece of paper that I had, had cut to this specific dimension and tried to squeeze his body into that frame. Um, literally, it's, it's a few seconds with Jacob and his sniper rifle um, <laughs> uh, trained in front of that piece of paper. Literally there as well, there are three men stationed a few inches from that paper. Um, and I've exposed it twice and that's why it looks as if there's movement. Um, and I try, to, I try to bring the guys in it, when I'm working with figures. I don't always work with figures, but when, I'm, when I am working with figures, I bring them in. I ask them to um, reenact this kind of situation of muscle memory that they have. Um, and then we look at their shadows together so that we all have a sense of the image that we're making and the representation that we're making so that it's something we make together. Um, I am not imposing a representative structure on them. We're working on that together. Um, so we look at the shadows. I train my 4x5 enlarger at the wall from like 30 feet away. Um, and then I expose three seconds. Then I expose another three seconds for the second exposure. And any kind of marks of process that happen during that kind of very brief period are, are a part of the handling of the piece and then a, almost an artifact of the, of the performance itself. And there's a lot of really interesting reenactment and performance in, in art making and filmmaking today. <laughs> um, um, there's this really interesting film called The Act of Killing out right now that's produced by Errol Morris um, and uh, Werner Herzog. I just saw it in New York. It's amazing. But it's all about these Indonesian um, genocidal killers who are reenacting their own stories. The filmmaker has let them reenact their own experience of having killed people, thousands of people. And at first they take it very, very um, comically and they... they um, they almost think of it like a cowboy western. Um, but by the, over the course of the movie, it's not therapeutic necessarily, but they've reenacted this experience so often that at least one of them seems to be coming to terms with what he's done. Um, and that's only one small, very recent um, example of reenactment and the effects it can have on people um, as, they're, as they're working through it. But I have found that reenactment is, is strong both for the subjects and for myself. Not that there's any particular pain associated with this work. Um, but that it brings up so much for them, and I learn so much um, from them over the course of the encounter. It's really what makes it worth it for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about kind of conventions of photography and formal moves I can make that, that are new for me and, and learn from each process and re each project, but I'm also really interested in tying my practice to my life and to the people that I encounter. So like, for example, in the spring, I've been invited to go to Kabul and um, this school of rock where these teenagers are learning to play electric guitar. And I mean, it's amazing. They're doing this thing in the middle of this ultimately frustrating and terrible and devastating life that they've had carved out for themselves. Um, and they're learning to play, you know, heavy metal. 
<laughs> and, and that kind of poetry of just being able to respond to situations of frustration um, without total surrender, with, with um, just the ability to hold on to very banal objects like a guitar, or in the case of one of my prior series um, about kind of people in the Egyptian revolution, their use of hoodies and sneakers and other kinds of really banal objects. I am invested in meeting those people and finding out you know, how they kind of hold on and move through their experiences. Because of course, very few of us have experiences that are quite so dramatic. Um, but I think I relate to them on a metaphorical level in terms of the process of everyday frustration and surrender. And I'm interested in finding out how they deal with it. And um, the encounter ends up being the most meaningful part for me about the work. Excellent. Any questions for Farah? I'm sure there are. Excellent. One of the other ways that I live with the project usually is, is spending time with the gear itself. So these are the large um, kind of manifestations around which a body of work will revolve, but the guns, the headsets, other kinds of parts of these guys' gear ends up in small prints, which is just a part of my kind of living with their stuff and their life and the stuff of their life for a longer period. And those pieces are never quite so architecturally responsive, but the objects tend to relate to the space of the page with more of a kind of a, a, a contained formal relationship. Yeah. Yes. Um, your work remind me of the origin of drawing, debutade who was the projection of the shadow on the wall. And those guys are like shadows, but they're white, white shadows. <laughs> then are you intending to remind us that our civilization is based on those guys? <laughs> Plato's cave. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if it's my intention to, rem to remind people that, that um, that their life is based on anything other than what they discover themselves. But um, I am really um, invested in subtracting a lot of information from my perception of these people and um, managing to create a, a specificity and at the same time a, a, very, um, a very specific space and a very fictional space at once um, and, and losing detail of feature and of context as part of that breadth. Um, sometimes I do feel as if I have to build detail back in and that's why I'll make sculptural negatives because when you look through a clear volume you actually sometimes do get detail and so in the smaller prints when I've, when I've examined each object on its own for a longer period of time and the light has settled through it you'll actually get a lot of the detail of the text and the rounding of the of the objects, but I never remake people. I think I've only done it once, I've remade myself. Um, because there's something so specific about a gesture and the hair on somebody's hand that like, I can't make a resin negative of it, a, ne a resin negative of it that would approach um, the specificity that a, a real human body can can communicate. Um, I did make one of myself once to situate within a photogram of other people's bodies in which they were rendered like this. And that was a moment when I was looking at some paintings at the Huntington and there was this, um, there was this painting of the tragic muse. It's called Sarah Siddons and the tragic muse. And there's this woman who's kind of in the throes of agony and she's got all these kind of ghosts of things she's thinking about around her. And um, you know, life is being lived around her. And I, I had just, I think there were a bunch of people in my life who had died, and I was, you know, there were a bunch of people who got married. There was just so much life being lived around me that I kind of remade this photogram with myself as the kind of centerpiece, just, you know, um, generic self. <laughs> and then all of these uh, kind of ghostly bodies around myself. So, yeah, I do, I do actually respond a lot to, um, to the idea of the shadow as, as being really, really specific and also really, really possible to project into as an open form. Thank you. Um, I think your work's absolutely wonderful, and I love the sculptures, and I didn't know anything about the, uh, where they came from. And my feeling has been, especially with this one, uh, of great sense of peace and, and light, and, and the sculptures are so full of light. I mean, everything's so full of light. And that seems to perhaps go against what you're trying to convey, but... No, not at all, because 
it's not like they're in the throes of agony. They've all worked through it, they're vets. Um, and I'm not in the throes of agony about this subject myself. Um, in fact, I think it's more useful to have um, a, a violent situation depicted with, um, you know, strawberry blonde <laughs> uh, palette um, with, with a kind of a sense of organization. Um, you know, if you think about like the literature that exists out there, the fiction about war and or peace, um, it's the voice of the writer that ends up um, resonating with the reader more than the war itself that's depicted in the novel. And, and I think that um, the voice that I'm trying to achieve here is nothing if not my own. It's um, certainly not a documentary journalistic voice. I'm not, I'm not in Kabul in the streets with the rifles. I'm in a dark room. Um, and so it's deliberately a representation um, that comes through the peaceful perspective both of myself as just an artist who's got formal conventions within which I'm working, and these guys, one of whom is actually a fashion design student, one of whom's a painting student, um, and another of whom isn't an artist, but he's, he's worked through his experience. Um, so I'm glad that it registers as peaceful um, and as something that, that doesn't um, create further conflict. <laughs> right. um, it's um, the... Uh, now, you've, now you've talked about what they're about. I mean, it was mysterious to start with. Now it's totally mysterious. And, <laughs> and there's so many conflicting things going on. Mm. But I'm still at peace with it. So it's, <laughs> but do you? I mean, do you have a specific message with that one, for example? Are you are you setting out to? You mean with respect to the issue of of conflict? No, just a message in setting it up the way you did. No, I mean, I want again. I want the encounter to speak for itself. I want you to feel implicated in an artwork. The situation of the artwork, stripped as it is of context is a warlike one, um, but then how do you feel, how does your body feel as you walk through that aperture? That's, that's, that's really what interests me. How, how do they feel? How do you feel um, physically? That's, that's where it comes from and, and what motivates a next work. I really do think very formally. When I think about going to Kabul, I love the idea of going to the School of Rock, but I also think um, about the stage as a, another level of display convention that's gonna be so fascinating to work with. How do I work with the idea of a stage? How can I make a resin guitar? Um, <laughs> um, you know, what kind of figures are gonna be able to be formed um, with these teenagers who are in skinny jeans and hijab? You know, like, all those kinds of um, indicators of specificity are, are what motivate the work and then it becomes what it becomes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, you know, just looking at some of these things, uh, you know, I'd seen your show at Jonathan Brown Space, and uh, w what's interesting about looking at these uh, these installation uh, pieces is is the sense of, of movement. Um, the, it, you know, on one hand, you have this shadow, this absence but you also have a presence and in this particular one over here you you really do have a sense of movement and this you you sort of move forward and into and back like proceeding and receding from it and that inevitably sort of um sort of draws you into it it activates the moment in a very um specific way mm -hmm. um so it, it's 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 more than it, it's presence and absence, and and it's duration. Yeah, and and yeah, it's a very it's a temporal aspect, and and I'm wondering, is, is that is that a direction that you're moving in away from like the kind of static objects that you had from Tahrir Square to you know this this kind of thing, and it also the idea of like the you know the aperture opening a room up, clearing a room. It, I mean, the action is like, it, it's very active. It's very activated. And, and I think, you know, I, it's hard to feel at peace with it. And even, even the, um, the sniper in back of you, you have this like sense of like something was there, something is still there. Something is once, you're dealing with like 
the, 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 the prelude and the aftermath at the same time. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I think that durational aspect has always been something that interested me since I started working with the photogram because one of... Um, because... Um, because things move. Yeah. As you're, as you're drawing, you can actually... I, I did a series um, around even just clear domestic objects like glasses when I was working on a piece um, after, after I'd been to Hiroshima. And I was rolling the glasses and recording that movement um, with the pieces you saw from the Egyptian uh, revolution. I was double exposing them as well. The spray can, um, I moved a couple times. The sneakers, right, I moved right, a couple times. Right. It's always, um, with the objects especially, it's, it's about me learning how they move. I'm trying to understand them, even if they're as simple as a glass or a pair of sneakers. Um, and with respect to the gear, when I went into the darkroom to photogram a sniper rifle, I was trying to figure out how it worked. I've never touched a sniper rifle before. <laughs> mm. um, you know, there's an AK-47. It has a little blade at the end. Well, as I double expose it, I will use that blade to incise the paper. And so I want it to be something, if you see those smaller prints, you can really see how um, I'm learning. And you can see that learning. Um, as that is, again, something that absolutely motivates the making of, of more work. Um, and in this case, again, it's a description, not of a decisive moment per se, but of a decisive experience. Um, and, and it is important formally for that composition that they're double exposed, but also um, not exactly in terms of a narrative, because it's not a story, but I think you can have memory without narrative, and that the memory isn't necessarily a static thing, even mm -hmm. when it doesn't include specific narrative. Um, so yes, yes, I would say that it's something that definitely recurs in the work. I don't know if it's the direction I'm going in, but it's something that's always, always been something that really interested mm -hmm. me. Um, and you mentioned the issue of the aperture. That's a new thing, actually. I um, did a piece at the OCMA for the triennial there, and I again used a doorway mm -hmm. where you're walking through um, a ruin. Um, and these two pieces are the first two pieces I've done with doorways. Mm -hmm. Before then, I was working with enclosed spaces that you couldn't enter. I was working with, and I did an atrium, I did a kitchen, I did um, a, a shipping container spaces that were rectangular, um, where I could kind of reiterate the structure through photographic work, um, but you almost couldn't enter. And in this case, that's opened up and you are, you're in it. Right. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's for me an extension of this understanding of the photograph as an object, which is something that I'm not sure has ever really been worked through extensively. Um, because when we thought about, you know, when painting became an object, um, that, that modern, that postmodern turn, that minimalist turn, um, that was after modernists had explored the painting as an object. When, when, when you think about modernist photography, you think about um, really unmanipulated black and white pictures from 35 millimeter negatives. We never had a moment of modernism where the photograph was considered as an object. And so everything that's happened in terms of the print's relationship to sculpture, to architecture, to objecthood has been really experimental and current. Um, and so I kind of feel as if um, uh, at the same time working in a very kind of contemporary palette and with contemporary subjects, I am kind of regressing a little bit to that moment um, in painting's history in the late 60s, like when, when the painting became an object. That's something I think about a lot. Well, that's actually an excellent segue into Matt's work. <laughs> um, so, so maybe uh, we can close it there, but thank you so much, Farah. That's wonderful. <laughs> Okay, everyone. So it's, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Matthew Brandt. Hi, everybody. Whoa, it is. Sorry, I'm going to stand. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Stand Quiet. Right here, maybe. Shh. It's thank you. It's kind of loud. I have a weird voice when you listen to yourself. Um, but thank you all for being here um, shortly after rush hour, I guess. I know it's hard. And thank you, Chris and Peter, for putting me on the walls. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be a part of the show. And thank you, Sarah and Farah. For going first. This is kind of intense. Um, and, uh, and also, I don't know if I'll be as eloquent and articulate as them, but I'll try my best. Um, but these pictures are from pictures of Rainbow Lake, uh, and it's a lake in Wyoming. Um, there's two pieces, this one and that one. The one that Jeff is in front of, which is good though. No, that's cool. 
Um, and one is sort of like a larger straightforward view and the other one is more fragmented but I like to think maybe kaleidoscopic view. And the, they're all traditional conventional sea prints that have been soaked in the lake water. Um, so these are part of a larger project called from, that are, that's called Lakes and Reservoirs. And in that project, the sort of procedure for that is to go around and photograph lakes around the western United States. And um, I, I sort of like the idea of this photographing lakes around the West because it has this kind of interesting relationship between exploring the West um, and, and photography. And I think that a lot of guys like Sullivan and Watkins and these historical photographers were going exploring the West and in sort of uncharted territories in the late 1800s and they were still also exploring photography as the medium because it was still in its sort of infantile stages. and. Um, and I sort of like that relation. So those are, that's just like a geographical parameter for choosing Western lakes. Because otherwise I could just go everywhere and just exhaust myself and just be tired all the time. Um, so Western lakes make sense, Western Northern American lakes. And this is Rainbow Lake. And I, and I liked Rainbow Lake um, because of its name. It was just, you know, I went there specifically really because of its name. I didn't know whether it was a nice lake or not. But, you know, I was hoping that I could do a good job in photographing them. So at one point, these looked like good, normal pictures, you know. I did rule of thirds and tried to do a good calendar-esque composition and sharpness. And I like to geek out in terms of the photo traditional techniques and making a good picture, going there with the 4 by 5 and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, too, when I go and visit these lakes, uh, I go with my camera, but I also go with like a five gallon jug of water, sometimes two, and I go and take a picture of the lake, but I also collect the water from the lake. So then I go back to my studio and then I make like conventional sea prints, sea chrome prints, um, and then I pour the water on a tray and then soak that lake, that sort of, sorry, soak that sea print in the lake water. So it's that point where the, Lake's photographic image sort of meets its material self, and these images are sort of relics of that process. Um, and, you know, sea print photography is, is kind of an amazing technology in and of itself. I mean, if you look at some of these, they, it's, these guys are geniuses, and it's amazing. They're, they're different colored la layers of blue on top of red on top of yellow, and you could see that this is where the lake water degraded it, and then it didn't take off here because this is an air bubble, and then it sort of comes off in different ways. So there's a big, huge sort of level of chance that, um, that you end up coming up with. And, and I think that's what keeps me going to make it too, because it's always kind of a surprise to see the certain color reactions. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, and anyways, so Sepochrome technology is, is this thing that, that I think also, I, when I started the project, it was, um, I thought, that I would maybe have, I started in 2008 and I thought I maybe would have had like maybe a three year stretch because I thought it's a medium, wet chemical photography is just becoming not very practical for anyone who actually makes prints. Um, and you know, it's more so just inkjet with te digital technologies and stuff like that. So I was thinking that in a way this is sort of about like, you know, latching on a little bit to wet chemical photography and, and making color prints and um, and so it seemed to make sense to equate sea prints, wet chemical photography with bodies of water. You know, and you can sort of get into like falling water lines or whatever, but I think that it's that just simple relation to wet and wet that kind of made sense to make pictures out of it. Um, and, and, and then this is like, I like Rainbow Lake as a grid. Uh, this is a more recent sort of, sorry, I'm gonna step back from my voice. It's like haunting me from behind. Um, but uh, and, I, and I like the, because this sort of is a little bit of a demonstration of the versatility of the process and, and the kind of the kind of limitlessness of just playing with colors and water, I guess, you know? Um, and I sort of chose the most colorful ones and then put them in a grid. Um, so that's Rainbow Lake. And if you guys have any questions, you could just interrupt me. Otherwise, I'm just going to ramble and talk about what I had for breakfast. Well, I, have, I have one question. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of photographers are dealing with traditional print.
printing techniques and uh -huh. so forth, bumping up against like you know supplies running out, et cetera, et cetera. Is the C print technology something that's like basically fading away and you can't access this stuff, or it's something that? I mean, yeah, you know, I I'm surprised that I can still do it, and I figured when I started this project that it would end when I can no longer get it. And I'm, I'm surprised that I can still get it, even though it's getting more difficult to order. Like now I have to order in rolls, I can't get the sheets anymore, and it's becoming more difficult, but still, maybe I'm just getting better at digging on the internet or something, but it's, you can still get it, but, um, but it's not as easy as it once was. Um, and I think that's what's sort of interesting too, because it's a good wind down to a project maybe, you know? But maybe not, I don't know, maybe it'll be around forever. Hopefully it will be. Kodak's great, but <laughs> bankruptcy? So it's, it's slightly endangered. It's not on the endangered list, but it's close. I would say, yeah, I'm surprised it's still around. Sorry for anybody who's a traditional <laughs> C-print color printer. Do we have uh, questions for Matt? Oh. Sure. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So I had a question about your process. Uh -huh. um, obviously you lay them face down if they have air bubbles, but how long do you let them sit within the tubs? Uh, it really depends on, like I guess the image density or the water or, I mean there's a lot of factors, maybe the humidity in my studio, if it's really nasty, I don't know. But um, I mean, and also I think this one was face up, this, these are face down. Um, but I started making the bigger ones face up because there's still some play in terms of how I decide. So when I put it down in the lake water, sometimes certain areas bubble up naturally. Because it's hard if you ever try to, you know, push something down in water, there's a natural resistance. So I try to let it delegate the composition, you know, like I push it down and this part naturally bubbled up. I mean, I could easily just like doink and then have that submerge, but you know, I try to let things, let chance take its course and work with it. But that's the fun part, is collaborating with water. But in terms of time, I don't have it like clocked out, but like, maybe, I mean, this could, I mean, this probably could have easily been in the lake water for, for maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks. Because um, if you look at these areas up here, like that, that's used to be just a big, huge puddle. Like this was a gigantic puddle. And I'm just sitting there waiting for it to evaporate, so it's just sitting in my studio. Um, and, you know, that kind of happens all the time, too. But the face-down one's a little bit easier. I just sort of, but it, also I can't see what's going on. Like these, I can kind of like, oh, it's cooking up nice, you know, or whatever, but time to drain, you know. But these, it's sort of, I just leave it and cross my fingers, I guess. So these are yeah. also a few weeks at a time? Um, yeah, I guess it's something. You know how it's like lifted under the corner. I think that's a good one. But yeah, I'm sorry. I, maybe like half a week it, for that one. I don't sure. know. It's so hard and, to say and exactly. Then do you use the same tub of water for each piece? Yeah. Well, for this is Rainbow Lake, so it's all the same water. Okay. You know, so this these are actually easier because it's like a small thing, and you know, I made these first before this. You know what I mean? So then I have a bunch of water, and then I just sort of right. So the residue is kind of left within. Oh yeah, the water gets pretty rank after about, you know, two months. Like I've had, maybe this is TMI, but like I've had people from my management of my studio coming in and like, what is this swamp? I think this breaks codes and they were gonna like look into the rent fine line and see if I'm breaking certain codes, but I just try to clean up nice. I'm gonna get a vent, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm like in the works of getting a nice vent, um, but yeah. Anyone else? Oh, here we go. Do you think that the chemical composition of the water has anything to do with the look of the pieces? Oh, definitely. I mean, some, I mean, when I pick up some water, there's a lot of sediments and things like that. And then when I pour it on the print, once that leaves, like even like little pieces of rock or whatever, it, it really eats away in that area too. Um, so I would say, yeah. And I've noticed that times are different too, and, but, and also some lakes water, get, they get kind of gross just sitting in the barrel. Like there's something, they start to turn green or, you know, certain things happen and some don't. So it's, I mean, I'm not necessarily like doing litmus tests or pH balance or anything to each one, but it's, they're always a little bit different, I can tell. And just making a few of these, I've learned that it, it is different, you know. But sometimes it, the C prints are different too. Sometimes I use, earlier I'm using like Fuji or Kodak stuff like that too. So there's some control depending on what I can grab.
grab my hands on, I guess. Have you ever tried using distilled water? No. I mean, but I use distilled water for other things, for like uh, all the like processes and stuff like that. That's always important. But not yet. But maybe it'll just sit there forever. I don't know. Probably not. I think it'll still break down. I'll, I'll do it and let you know. <laughs> so each one of these images start out as a a traditional C print. Oh yeah, yeah. And then just it breaks the, down. So yeah. You don't so add this the water used to be a good you... photo. <laughs> and now I just messed it up. I guess yeah. Okay. And it's just the color breakdown. I mean, and they're all the same photo. Oh yeah, that's another thing too. They're, they're the same picture re the repetition. Same so I should have said that in the beginning. I feel like that was a. Oh sorry. I think there's one back there too. Question. I was wondering, since you're using orga like these organic materials, do you care about the archivability of these pieces? How do you fix it? Because it will keep eating away at that, am I right? No, I mean, at, in terms of my research and meeting with other conservationists and stuff like that, it's pretty much just as, uh, what's the word, just as archival, stable, yeah, thanks stable as like a normal conventional print. It's just the colors are sort of just moved. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's not uh, anything, so, as long as it stays dry, okay, I mean so, like anything else. I think. So it won't keep eating away no, I mean, once not, you take it off? Yeah, there's no like acids or caustic things. Okay. It's just lake water. And you know, like a normal print is washed. So it's okay. always had a normal water. But there's other projects I've done that have archival issues, you know, in terms of printing with candies and stuff like that, which is a whole nother issue. But Maybe I don't want to go there. Okay, thanks. What uh, aesthetics, philosophies, or ideas motivate you and your artwork? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, oh I'm starting to sweat. Um, uh, I would say a lot of um, like photo history, I would think that really gets me going, but um, Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> I'm sorry. In plain English, like what ideas influence you and make you, oh, I want to make photos like this, maybe artists of the past or yeah. movements? Yeah, um, I mean, I was influenced by a lot of, like I came to, went to school, went back to school at UCLA and studied with like Jim Welling and Kathy Opie and Morgan Fisher and these guys, they really helped influence me thinking about obvious, like Jim Welling, it's thinking about photography and color and constructs, and he really, you know, thinking about these guys, and I feel like um, there's a number of people that I sort of studied with. I worked for a photographer, Robert Polidori, as his assistant, and learned how to carry equipment really well, and I think that taught me something. <laughs> um, but in terms of a larger sort of like aesthetics thing, I think I've Earlier on, I was interested in reading like psychoanalytical literature, like Lacan always interests me, and thinking about the, you know, relation between image and real. I mean, I feel like that's here. There's the image of the lake, and then there's the real lake water coming in, and you know, things like that kind of, you know, I feel like worked itself out some way or another into these pieces. Um, but I don't know. I can think of a reading list later too. I'm sorry. No, no. Anyone else? Oh. Um, okay, so you might have already said this, but how exactly did you get that into the water? Like, what did you use? Oh, yeah, well... Specifically uh, yeah, specifically that size. Oh, yeah, imagine like this, a big, huge tray this size, like kind of badly built. And with like a bunch of plastic, because I used to try to make a bunch of my photo trays properly with fiberglass, but I just could never do it right. So I had to realize like a really thick plastic mill would work to cover it. And just imagine a huge tree, I mean, sorry, tray, out of trees, I guess, wood tray. And it's like on sawhorses. And so it's just, and the, I put the water in it. It's a, like a big, huge, like nasty looking kiddie pool. And then I put the um, print in it. And I try to poke it down. I have some things I can use to 
poke it down in certain areas, but I try to also let it do its thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like a big bathtub, shallow bathtub. Can I ask, um, do you have a preference to like what kind of focal length you use in your pictures? Is it always the same? Oh, um, I try to do the whole old school F64, get as much in focus, you know? Um, so I, I try to stick with the conventions of like Ansel Adams, you know, black points, white points, and, and in terms of focal point, I try to get everything I can. But sometimes I just get lazy too. It's hard to get it all in one shot. And then you was know. this, can I ask, is this a 35 millimeter? No, no, actually, no, well, the, these, the bigger ones, I started to do, these are the first ones where I started to shoot digitally. Oh. And uh, like all the other sizes are four by five and large format. But um, with, this, with this scale, it's just, I couldn't, there's no printers that do that. You know, I used to print at UCLA, the widest they could go is 50 inches wide. But um, with these, I shoot digitally and I have, I do a photo stitch thing. I just go like that, you know? And yeah. then um, cross my fingers that it all comes together. Yeah. Like, yeah. Excellent. Do we have anyone else? No, I think that's terrific. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you, guys.